Bless the Lord, my soul. Oh, my soul. I worship His holy name. I sing like never before. Welcome to worship this morning on this fantastic day. These are the days when I'm really glad that worship starts at 9.30 in, the mo in this morning rather than 11 o'clock because by 11 o'clock it's going to be warm under the tent. Yeah. We're supposed to hit uh, 97 today, I heard, which is uh, a big jump from yesterday. Jennifer and I went to the farmer's market yesterday and Jen's out there going, man, I need my coat because it was so cold. And then here we are looking at uh, almost hitting 100 degrees. But it's great because we are here under the tent, beautiful scenery, chance to get together to worship, and it is exciting to see everyone who is here uh, joining us this morning. A couple of things I want to mention. Uh, the first thing is our Wednesday Bible study that we've been meeting each week on Zoom. We're going to put on hiatus for the rest of the summer. Uh, just because I know it's really hard for people to come together at 6.30 on a Wednesday evening when the weather's nice outside, which it promises to be for a while. So we'll be kicking that back off in September again. Uh, maybe the, uh, the option that we have for community groups for a while 
is to do the online Bible study. So just, just throw that out into your, uh, into your mind so you're aware. Another thing that we are doing right now is, believe it or not, no matter what happens, one way or another, there will be some form of education happening come this fall. Uh, I know everybody's got different opinions about it. Talk to my wife. She's in one heck of a spot right now as they try to figure out what's going on. There is no good answer, honestly. It's going to be a mess of work. But we will have kids going back to school in some way. That means we will still be participating with the Ridgefield Family Resource Center for the Back to School Bash. Uh, we have been asked this year as they figure out how they're going to make that work. Uh, in the past, we've had all these little bags that we've handed out, and you guys have packed them full of school supplies. This year, they're asking for backpacks. And uh, so in talking with Mike, uh, Mike, I set a challenge of one, we are going to gather 100 backpacks to donate to the Ridgefield Family Resource Center. You go, wow, 100 backpacks. Well, let me tell you, I had somebody show up at the church office this week and drop off 31. Okay? In addition to the 24 that we had gathered last fall after the uh, back to school bash. So we're more than halfway there. All right? So uh, we, uh, I would love to, the next few weeks by August 15th, see if we can collect somewhere in the ballpark of another 30, 40 backpacks that we can donate. Um, they can be any variety, although uh, I would encourage people to try to look also for high school age backpacks. They tend to get a lot of the little kid ones because you can buy them and they're fun and they've got Dora on the back. And if you're in high school, going to school, carrying a Dora backpack is not where you want to be. Uh, so if you can help us out with that, that would be great. We'll be collecting here on Sunday mornings. Connect with me at the office. You can drop them off. But we're more than halfway to our challenge goal of 100. Man, if we could donate 100 backpacks, I'd be blown away. Uh, the only other thing I have to mention is we are planning to have our summer congregational meeting after worship today. Yes? Okay, just checking. You were worried about quorum. We are a little small today, but I think we can still meet that and discuss and approve our budget and all that sort of thing. So stick around. Uh, I guarantee you uh, it, won't be, it won't be that long. I'm promising. Uh, but we would like to update you on everything that's going on. And I think, am I leaving anything out, Elena? I think that's all of it. I think that's all of it. So if you would join me this morning, I'd like to share a scripture verse with you before we uh, take our time of confession. And it comes out of first or out of Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter one, in verse two or in verse six. I'm sorry. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, "For this re reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands." What Paul says is, he says, "You have been imparted the gift of the presence of God into your life. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid." but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And with that, will you join me this morning as we confess our sins before God as one community together. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I invite you to take just a moment this morning to reflect upon your life and upon the sins that you have committed and to offer them up before God. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you, God, the word and the deed. What we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us 
so that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And with that, I would invite you, as you are able, to stand and let us confess our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I would invite you this morning to stay standing as I turn it back over. I don't know if you noticed, we have a guest with us this morning. Austin has come back to join us today. So he and Bridget will lead us in a couple of songs as we worship together this morning. All the new people are like, who's this guy? And all the old people are like, we thought we got rid of this guy. <laughs> all right, let's sing.
Just experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness, God. Your goodness, Holy Spirit, you are. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only Man. 
gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come this morning and we give thanks. We give thanks, Lord, that this is the day that you've made. And Lord, we give thanks that we can rejoice and we can celebrate today because this is the day that you have created for us. Lord, you built the Sabbath not for you, but for us so that we would have a time to come to rest in your presence, Lord, to find the, the recharging of our souls that we so desperately need. And so we come this morning, Lord, and we give thanks for this day and for this time together. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit as we are gathered here in your presence as it, as it moves through this place today. We come also this morning, Lord, just giving thanks for the for all of the blessings that you've poured out upon us in our lives, for the way that you have gifted us, for the way that you have provided for us, for the way that you have given us the gift of faith, Lord, that we live not in hopelessness, but instead with the hope of the resurrection. Lord, we just pray that you would fill us with your presence this morning. And it's also in that, Lord, that we come and we take up your invitation to bring our prayer requests before you, our needs. Lord, the challenges in our own lives, in the lives of our family and friends, the challenges in our nation, the challenges in the world in which we live. Lord, we live in a broken world, one that you created perfect but has been broken by our sins. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the strength to endure the challenges and hardships that are placed before us, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength and the ability to continue to have faith, even in the midst of opposition, even in the midst of, of persecution, even in the midst of just those times, Lord, when we are challenged for the faith that we have. We pray that you would give us the ability to stay steadfast. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the ability to grow in our faith. Lord, that we would not stay where we are, but we would pursue you each and every day of our lives and that we would grow and we would, we would, that we would become more like the people of Jesus that you have created us to be. Help us to grow in our faith, Lord. We come this morning, Lord, laying before you the prayers of our church. We pray for a coworker of Jennifer's who is battling cancer, Lord. We pray as she begins treatment here in the next two weeks, Lord, we pray that she would once again beat this illness. Lord, give her the strength during this time to endure the treatment she will undergo. And Lord, give her peace and comfort in the midst of it. And Lord, we pray this morning that if it's your will, you would touch her and that you would remove that cancer from her body. You are the great physician, Lord. There is nothing that is beyond your power and ability. So we pray that you would lay your healing hand upon her, Lord. We pray this morning, Lord, for Fawn Glover. As she, has a, uh, as she has a meeting with another specialist coming up, as she has uh, been told she's not a candidate for surgery and is still dealing with, uh, with issues of pain and mobility, Lord, we pray that this, this next doctor that she meets with will have the solution to her troubles. Lord, we pray that you would grant her relief from her pain. Lord, just place your healing hand upon her. We pray for Tony Enright, who received a heart transplant. Lord, we pray for her recovery, for her body to accept that organ. And Lord, for her to recover and regain the strength and abilities that she once had. We pray for Joyce, who's, follow, who's uh, suffering a stroke following surgery. Lord, we pray for your hand upon her. We pray for her healing. Lord, we pray for the other members of our worship team, for Devin and for Amara and for Ryan as they are traveling today. Uh, we just pray that you would be with them, spending some family time. Just, uh, just be with them, that they may find refreshing in this time of, uh, in this time of rest. And we give thanks for, uh, for Bridget and for Austin for being here today, Lord. They continue to lead us in worship. Lord, we pray for our communities. We pray for all the struggles and all the challenges. We pray for the anger. We pray for the divisions. We pray for those, Lord, who are expressing their anger in so many ways, in so many ways that are, uh, that are driven by, by hurt and frustration, but also so many ways that are destructive and damaging, Lord. We pray for peace. We pray for those who have given their lives, Lord, into service for our communities, our police and our fire. 
our emergency medical people. We pray for their protection, Lord, as they deal with incredibly difficult situations. We pray for the doctors and the nurses and all of the people who are working in our hospitals, Lord, on the, on the forefront of this pandemic, Lord. We pray for their safety. We pray for their rest, Lord. We pray that you would grant them strength. As many of them are around our nation are working themselves to the brink of exhaustion. We pray, Lord, for our educators as they face a very uncertain school year. We pray for all of our leaders, our president and his staff, both parties and both houses of Congress, our leaders in our state, in our county, in our cities. We pray, Lord, that you would grant them wisdom and the ability to govern well. May they listen to your voice, Lord, and lead according to your will. For all the other challenges in our lives, Lord, we lift all of this up to you. We place it in your capable hands. And we pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we take our offering. The offerings that we take go to support the ministries of Christ's community as we continue to do God's work in the community that we're in. Up on the screen, you can see we have multiple ways that you can give back to God out of the blessings that he has given you, whether that's online at ccridgefield.com, whether that's in the church app on your phone, in the red drop box by the entry over here, or even mailing us in the office. Uh, we can get it any way like that. And we would just invite you to take a few moments this morning. Austin is going to share with us just a special song this morning. Uh, and we would invite you just to reflect on how God has blessed you uh, during this time. We continue our worship celebration with the giving of our tithes and offerings. I've been up all night fighting doubts You know I haven't slept a wink There's a mountain before me Will I make it through the day? The weight is getting heavy And my legs becoming weak Oh Lord, hear my cry Jesus, carry me Carry me this day Straighten my path, oh, show me the way. My burden is heavy, lighten my load. I give it to you, cause I can't make it on my own. Jesus, carry me. There are battles raging in my mind. Second guessing all the time Voices keep telling me life has no point But I know that you love me And you help me through the day Oh Lord, hear my cry Jesus carry me Carry me this day Straighten my path Oh, show me the way My burden is heavy Lighten my load I give it to you Cause I can make it on my own Jesus, carry me I want to live life the way you live life I want to love the way you love. I want to see me the way you see me. I want to be like you. 
straighten my path. Oh, show me the way. My burden is heavy. Lighten my load. I give it to you. Cause I can't make it on my own. Jesus, carry me. Carry me this day. Straighten my path. Oh, show me. I can't make it on my own. Jesus, carry me. Well, thank you, Austin, for that because I was just uh, I was thinking through some of those words as you were as you were singing that, and uh, you know the kind of the general message of that song is, you know, I can't make it on my own, right? Jesus, carry me. I give it over to you. And interestingly enough, we didn't plan this this way. We never do. But this is kind of where we're going today. We are starting a new series this week that we're going to be going through the next couple of, uh, well, through most of August, talking about the question, am I enough? Am I enough? In who I am right now, in the capabilities that I have, am I enough? And what we're talking about right now is we're talking about calling. And when we talk about calling, God's calling on our lives, it requires us to reach the point where we say, you know what? I am not enough. I need Jesus to carry me. I need to turn it over to him. I need to let him lead through my life. This new series that we're at, at, we're going to look at the story of Moses. If you know anything about the story of Moses and the call that God places on his life, Moses is one person who very much demonstrates the fact that in truth we are not enough. In and of ourselves, we are not enough. I think every single one of us struggles with doubt or questioning when it comes to the call of God on our lives. We ask the question, am I even called? Do I have a calling? What is it? Am I equipped? Am I capable of carrying it out? Do I even want to? Or do I want to do it? When God is talking to us, when he's moving us to action, so often we, we come up with excuses and reasons not to answer the call, not to listen when he's speaking. I, we come up with things like, you know what, I don't, really, I don't do hospitals. You know, I, I, don't, I don't talk to people about my faith. I don't do children. I don't do outreach. There is no way I am knocking on somebody's door. Are you kidding me? I don't do visiting. I don't do Bible study. Certainly don't lead Bible study. So we convince ourselves that maybe God isn't calling. Our list of I don'ts actually becomes a lot longer than, I, than our I do's. And I haven't talked to each and every one of you about this, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was at least a point in each and every one of our lives where we'd come up with some of these. Lots of reasons why not to do something. But oftentimes it comes down to thinking I can't or I don't want to. This is where Moses is in his story. Moses is all over the book of Exodus. And we're going to look just at the beginning. If you haven't read the book of, of Exodus in its entirety, I would invite you to do so. Take some time. Open it up. This is an adventure story. Okay, there's a lot of stuff happening in the book of Exodus. It's, you know, if you think the Bible is, is boring and hard to read, Exodus is a page turner. There's all kinds of stuff that takes off right from the beginning. But we're just going to look at the beginning of Moses' story in Exodus. And he gets called by God in a very obvious way. And he has a lot of reasons why he is not suitable for the call. He even goes so far as to suggest to God other people who might be better than him. Have you ever done that one? No, God, you couldn't possibly mean me. Have you met my brother? 
You know, he's better at it. He's better at it. And what we want to focus on during this time, over the next few weeks, is this question, am I enough? Now, I've already let you in on the secret, right? We're not. The truth of the matter is, we are not enough. This will work better if I put it up here. We are not enough. Oh, wait, listen to that. Wondered why I was so quiet, Jeff. You've got to give me a high sign. I didn't realize it was still hanging down here. No matter, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter how respected you think you are, no matter how skilled you think you are, you are not enough. On the flip side of that, no matter how good you think you are not, how smart you think you are not, how respected you think you're not, or how skilled you think you're not, God can still use you. In fact, he, this is what he prefers to do. This is where he prefers to work. He likes to work with people who go, I don't have the ability, because it means that we can't come at it with our own, uh, with our own self-confidence, but instead we have to rely on God. We have to be honest about our abilities and be willing to lead where God wants to, or be willing to follow where God wants to lead us. Moses' excuses, the excuses he uses, they are just like ours. And we look at this, this is a time that is so far into the past, we can't even, it's really hard to date the time of Moses. But suffice it to say, this is thousands of years before our time. And yet the irony of Moses is, his excuses are just like the ones that we use today. The problem is Moses is, he's got the wrong question in mind. You know, he's, he's saying, God, how can I do this? I don't have the ability. His focus is in the wrong place. Where Moses' focus needs to be is it needs to be on who God is. And today, with the question that we are asking for today, we're, we're not even getting into the other stuff. Am I enough is going to carry us through a bunch of weeks. But today, I just want to ask the question, am I called? Quite simply, are we called? How do we know if we are called by God? What we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, not just once, not just one time, but daily, we need to ask the question, how is God calling me? And is he going to go with me? Okay, how is God calling me and is he going to go with me? with me. When we ask this question, we make this part of our daily routine. What we do is we put this idea of searching for God's call on our lives directly into the forefront of our minds. Because what we're going to see with Moses is that God calls him, but he also doesn't leave Moses alone. He doesn't leave Moses to go on his own. A lot of stuff happens in Exodus, and it can be easy to focus on the amazing things, you know, as Moses gets in there and he dukes it out with Pharaoh in Egypt. You know, as God performs all these amazing signs and he turns rivers to blood and he sends locusts on, on, the, uh, on Egypt and he, he parts the Red Sea and, and all of these things that happen in the Exodus. But throughout the story of Exodus, we get this understanding of God's calling on the life of Moses. He calls and then he walks with him and he equips Moses and he empowers him and he gives him the tools necessary to carry out the call. Am I called? Am I called by God? And once I ask that question, how do I respond? Our biggest dodge is when we actually discern or recognize the call, but we don't like where it's pointed. I've had a few of those moments in my life. I've tried to push back against the call, convince myself that God isn't actually calling when I hear his voice. I push back against it because I don't really want to go where uh, where he's heading. And so what I want to do is first whether you've read the story of Moses before or not, I want to really recap how Moses got started. And it all starts in in this time period about 400 years after uh, after the time of Joseph. And you might remember Joseph. He was Jacob's youngest son, he was the one who was sold, uh, if, you've, uh, if you've ever watched, um, uh, if you've ever seen the stage production Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, anyone seen that? 
That's the kids we're talking about, right? Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He gets sold into Egypt, and this whole story happens, but eventually the Israelites under his father Jacob end up moving into Egypt, and it's a good thing. There's famine in the land. Joseph had found favor in Pharaoh's household. He set things up, and for years, the Israelites live peacefully in the nation of Egypt. But 400 years go by, and Exodus says, a Pharaoh arose who knew nothing about Joseph. By this point, the Israelites were an unwanted trouble to Pharaoh. He was afraid that the Israelites would grow so numerous, they would take over the nation, that they would overthrow Pharaoh, they would would push out the native Egyptian people. And so he devises this plan to try to keep the Israelites, the Hebrew nation, in check. And part of this is fear of a strong Hebrew leader. And so he begins this purge of all male children, going through Egypt, killing them all. And so when Moses is born into this environment, his mother, uh, his mother with the midwife, they manage to save Moses. They take Moses and they put him in a basket and they shove him out into the Nile River. And miracle of miracles, Moses is found, right? Moses is found by the daughter of Pharaoh. And he's brought into Pharaoh's palace, and he's raised as Pharaoh's adopted son. And so for 40 years, Moses grows up in Pharaoh's palace. One day, Moses is out walking. He sees one of the Hebrew people being mistreated by a guard, and so he kills the guard. And now, knowing that he's been found out, he flees. He flees into the desert, and he spends 40 years living in the desert. He meets a man by the name of Jethro. He's a priest, marries his daughter, and spends 40 years caring for his father-in-law's sheep. And this is where our story enters. Moses, who was raised in Pharaoh's palace, and then spends this time in isolation or exile, And Psalm chapter 23, verse 5, the psalmist writes, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And I love this verse because this verse talks about the first 40 years of Moses' life. This is the first 40 years that Moses spent. He spent 40 years right in the midst of his enemies, the ones that God would train him up, empower him, and equip him to fight against. God shaped Moses to be his agent. And so here's a quotable for you. No one can stop you from becoming the person God wants you to be. You know that? No one can stop you from becoming the person that God wants you to be. God spent 80 years shaping Moses into the person that he wanted Moses to be. Think about it for a minute. Right from birth, Moses had been on this path to be God's agent to lead his people out of Egypt. He was preparing Moses even before Moses knew there was a plan. When the call came to Moses, he was 80 years old. And this gives us another little message in here, too. You're never too old to be used by God. I just like want to throw that out. This is one of the excuses that comes up. Hey, you know what? That's for a younger person. That's for somebody with more energy. I use that periodically. You know, maybe if I were in my 20s again. But you're never too old to be used by God. If you think you missed your chance, think again. Moses was 80 when it happened. And so it takes us to Exodus chapter 3. This is where we start this morning with the question, am I called? Exodus chapter 3 is the account of Moses' calling. And it says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. He didn't even have his own sheep. Forty years in the wilderness, and he was still tending his father-in-law's sheep. Eighty years old, and he doesn't have his own flock. I would think that things would feel a little hopeless by that point. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush, 
And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. And so Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now Moses could have ignored God. I don't know how many of you seen a bush burning in the wilderness where there shouldn't be one wouldn't go, I'm going to go take a look at that. You know, that bush is on fire. It's not being consumed. I mean, God chose something that definitely gets your attention. But Moses could have ignored it. He could have chosen not to engage with God, but he doesn't. He goes over and he engages. And here's what happens. When you engage with God, you connect with something that's much bigger than yourself. When you engage with God, you connect with something that is way bigger than anything that you can comprehend. He makes you more than you are. He moved Moses from a nobody, the disgraced adopted son of Pharaoh, the caretaker of his father-in-law's sheep, to the agent of God's incredible work in Egypt. By the way, when Moses is out on the far side of the wilderness, he he goes to Horeb, which was called the mountain of God. This mountain is special. Anybody know why? Anybody know another name for Mount Horeb? What's that? Sacred. Sacred, okay. But it's known as Mount Sinai. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It's on this mountain that Moses engages with God to receive his call. And it's also on this mountain following the Exodus that Moses again engages with God and receives God's law and the Ten Commandments. So Moses starts his calling there. And then when this whole story of the Exodus is ready to wrap up, before the wilderness wandering and all that stuff, but when when this whole piece of the story is ready to wrap up, Moses is right back there on that mountain once again engaging with God. And so in Exodus 34, Moses stands in God's presence, and and this this is at the end. You know, he's received the Ten Commandments. He stands in God's presence. He comes down from the mountain with this radiant face. Bearing this radiance from his interaction with God. All of Moses' life was leading him to this mountain. And then he gets led back to this mountain after he completes the work that God puts before him. This is what God does when he calls. He changes lives. By the time he was 80, I'm sure Moses had given up on ever doing anything of significance. But God calls even when we have given up. His preparation for Moses began the moment Moses was born. Philippians chapter 1, it says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God will carry out what he begins. It may feel like you're in a stale spot. Maybe you feel like you're in a plateau or you're stuck in a valley and it feels like things aren't moving. But Philippians promises that the one who begins the good work and that one is God will carry it on to completion until the day when Christ comes back, until the day you stand face to face with Jesus. God is working his will out in your life. Moses may not have realized it. He may not have recognized it. But through his entire life, he was never alone. God was with him throughout all of those 80 years. Throughout every moment, God was there witnessing him growing up in the palace. God was there when he killed the guard over over his interaction with that Hebrew man. God was there when he fled into the wilderness. God was there during those 40 years when he was living, caring for his father-in-law's sheep. Every moment of Moses' life, God was present. And one reason I think that we so often give for not following God's call is that we say we don't hear it or we don't recognize it. You know, if only God would speak clearly so I can hear. Have you ever felt like that sometimes? If God would just speak in a voice that I can hear, then I would believe, then I would be ready, then I would be willing to step out. If only God would speak. The problem is, Jesus was God's voice, clearly spoken to the people. Jesus was sent down to be the physical incarnation of the invisible God. 
And yet in John chapter 6, Jesus says in John chapter 6, he says, you know what? You've seen me. You've heard me teach. You've witnessed the miracles. You've been in my presence. You've, you've, you've seen what's happened and still you don't believe. I am the audible voice of God, Jesus says. In fact, John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and it's speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the word of God, the voice of God. He is the audible presence of God into the world, and still he wasn't believed. An audible voice is not a guarantee that we will hear and we will heed the word of God. Instead, it requires that we pursue and seek him out. We are not going to hear his call if we're not paying attention. So often the burning bush is something a lot more subtle in our lives. You know, Moses had kind of an unfair advantage. You know, God used a big, you know, a big, hey, here I am. And Moses actually paid attention. But more often, God's calling is seen in our circumstances in whispers, and in open doors. We don't hear the call because we're not listening. 1 Kings chapter 19, this is the interaction with God and Elijah on the mountainside. And some of you might be familiar with this, but in 1 Kings 19, verse 11, it says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. He's speaking to Elijah. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. God is coming. He's going to come by on this mountain where you are. How incredible that moment must have been for Elijah. The the, uh, Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But God wasn't there. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the earthquake came a what? A gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and he stood in the mouth of the cave. God's call is so often, it comes in whispers and open doors and in circumstances where we don't even expect him to work. I've told before my story about how I got to Christ community. But it started way back shortly after Jennifer and I got married. And Jennifer will tell you, here she was several years into her career. She knew from the time she graduated high school, she knew where she was going. When I graduated high school, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. You know, I spent a number of years traveling around in Alaska, working for a cruise line, you know, doing a bunch of stuff. I'm surprised I didn't end up on a fishing boat. That's what a bunch of the guys that I graduated with did. You know, while people were taking off right after high school and going to college, I couldn't even go to community college. I couldn't even take the basic classes because I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, little did I know that God was preparing me for the direction he had in store. If I hadn't taken off from high school and gone to Alaska, I never would have met Jennifer. If I hadn't met Jennifer, I never would have heard the call into ministry. If I hadn't heard the call of ministry, I wouldn't have spent 11 years going to school to get to that point. Boy, some of you think your college time was long. You know, you get finished and go, gosh, I'm done with my, I'm done with my undergrad studies, and I still don't know where I'm going. You spend a bunch of years still kicking around only to find out you got to go, you know, on to seminary. But I never would have heard that call if I hadn't followed the open doors. See, so much of my life, so many of the the plans that I had for myself didn't work out. I think open doors are the biggest indicator of the direction that God wants us to go. Because I tried going a whole bunch of different places and none of them worked out. It's kind of like, anybody ever ever herded sheep? Right? Okay, so if you herd sheep, if you need to get them out of the pen, there's only one gate. There's only one way out. They'll mill around and mill around, but if they want to get out, they got to go the one direction that lets them out of the pen and into the pasture. This was my problem. I was milling around and milling around until I finally walked through the one door that was open for me. And when I walked through that door, then there was another one. I didn't always know how God was leading, 
By the time I realized that I was being called to be a pastor, which, by the way, was nowhere on my radar. I've said this before. I don't like public speaking. I don't like being in front of people. Okay? This is where God has a sense of humor. Because what did he do? I said, I am not going to do that. Morning. Hi, everyone. Here I am. Hello. (laughs) I wasn't headed that direction, and yet God opened the doors. And after 11 years of going to school and preparing and planning, I get a call from a church in a business park in Vancouver, and Jennifer and I looked at each other and we said, that's not where we're going. We are not moving. We are happy where we're at. Jennifer's in her career. We were convinced that God was going to give us something where we were at. In fact, I told God exactly what he was planning for us. Okay? Let me tell you about where we're going to be. I had a plan. And we came down and we met with the call committee at Christ Community because we thought it was the right thing to do, right? We didn't want to just say no without actually going. You get this feeling like, you know, if we go and we, we talk to them, then we can say no and say, look, we tried. You know, we did, we did the right thing. We didn't just brush them off. And I, I've, if you've been around any length of time, you've heard me tell this story. You know, we came down to Centralia. We met with the group from Christ Community and Jennifer cried the whole way home because she knew we were coming down here, and we moved down here. And it's not always been an easy road, but here's the thing. Open doors are opportunities to follow God's call. If you say, I don't know what God wants me to do, look where the doors are open. He may not tell you in an audible voice to share Jesus with your neighbor, but he may put you next to a neighbor that needs to hear, and that neighbor just happens to be someone that you get along with someone that you have common interests with, someone that you can talk with and build a relationship with. And maybe, just maybe, someday the opportunity comes to share Jesus. And so all the while you were saying, I don't share Jesus with people. And yet you live next door to a neighbor who comes to you one day and says, my marriage is falling apart, can you pray for me? He may not tell you with an audible voice to visit the hospital. But then someone you know is in there and you go to see them and they happen to be in in a bed next to someone who needs to talk. That happened to me. I went in to see someone else in the hospital and the person in the next bed over, I spent 45 minutes with that person talking with them and praying with them. Never met them before. I don't talk to people I don't know, okay? Okay. I spent 45 minutes talking and praying with the person in the next bed over. He may not tell you in an audible voice to join a mission trip to Mexico, but maybe you like tacos. You go, well, I could go for that. He may not tell you in an audible voice to do prison ministry, and then maybe you have a cousin who's in jail. I don't know what the circumstances are, but oftentimes it's not the direction we're looking or it's not the way we expect to get there. Here's the deal. You want to know if God, how God is calling you? Look at the strengths that you have and see how you can use them for God's church. Every single one of us is called in some way to service in God's name. Where can you use what you know to be an agent of the gospel? You go, I don't feel God's calling me to anything that that my strengths are, you know, that utilizes my strengths. Great, this is the other side of it then. Maybe you're called to something outside your comfort zone. Maybe you're called to come and do public speaking in front of a church. My freshman speech class was a nightmare. Great professor. I was terrible. I hated getting in front of people. You should have seen me trying to learn how to preach in college. Scared the living daylights out of me. Maybe you're being called outside your comfort zone, outside of your skill set. How is he calling, though? Because here's the thing about Moses. Moses was called way outside of his skill set. The only thing he knew was sheep. 
except for those 40 years growing up with the best education that the region had to offer. And it may have taken 80 years, but God used him for his glory. Look for where God has given you compassion or desire. You may not have the skills. But that doesn't mean that God isn't calling you in that direction and leading you down a path to learn how to serve him in an area that you totally don't expect. I love to talk about how Christ's community got to Ridgefield. What were we, 12 years at East Ridge Business Park? By the way, this is, another, this is another place where I think God has a sense of humor because I got here, I was pastor for one year and the conversation starts centering around whether Christ's community is closing his doors. Okay? That's not a conversation that you want to be trying to lead through in your first year of pastoring. And yet, as we discussed and talked about the future of this congregation, God made one thing clear, that there was still a purpose. And I, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't write it out. He didn't shout it in my ear. He didn't appear in a burning bush and say, you know, say to me and to say to Lauren, because he was chairman of the congregation. He didn't, he didn't pop up in a burning bush and say, hey, I got a plan. Here's what it is. He didn't lay it out for us. We're still trying to figure it out. But man, he opened the doors for us to get up here. You know, we had a conversation with the school district. They said, we'd love to have you come and meet in our school. You try to meet in a school in this day and age, most schools are not eager. You know, they give you a little bit of time. I was part of a portable church in a school in the Seattle area, and they said, we'll give you one year, and then you have to find another spot. Here, I talked to them the other day because we don't have a reservation for fall yet because of everything going on. And they said, oh, yeah, don't worry. We know, you're, we know that you're going to be there, so we have you on our calendar. Dave, when did, uh, when did Carol open up? What were you doing when we found our office space? Three o'clock in the morning reading the Ridgefield blog? Yeah. <laughs> it was up for 12 hours, and then it was down again because we took it. God provides a way. He makes a way. I can't tell you how God is calling you, but I can tell you that he is. Don't go looking for him in the earthquake, but instead you need to listen to the whisper. So I'm going to leave you with a challenge this week as we get ready to go out. I want to leave you with this. Spend some time listening for the whisper this week. You may know where God is calling you right now, but I guarantee you that's not all he's calling you to. This is the thing. God calls and he calls over and over. Spend some time listening for the whisper this week. What is God saying? How does he call you to be involved with his mission? Because he's doing it right now. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just give thanks for calling. I pray, Lord, that you would move in our lives, that you would help us to see how you are calling us, where you want us to go. Help us to listen, to the, uh, help us to listen for the whisper, Lord. And give us hearts that are willing to step out in faith, even if we don't know where that's leading. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we go out this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, I would invite you to stand. We will share the blessing. We're going to do one more song, and then we're going to have our uh, relatively quick congregational meeting this morning. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
dark wonder at the mention of your name. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.